Good evening, Brennan, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi Lockdown Lecture Series. This is meeting number 57. I'm delighted that you're all here this evening on such a, a, a beautiful sunny evening, but I bitterly cold I, when I was out bringing the bins in. So it's a delight to have you all here. Can I, as ever, can I remind you to please keep your uh, cameras on and a recognisable name uh, within the screen as per the Grand Lodge of Scotland guide lines. Thank you so much, Brian. Please can you also sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages. Uh, Brian, I, I don't normally uh, wish birthday wishes uh, to our visitors, mainly because uh, I don't always know, uh, but Brother Ian Waugh, one of the past Substitute Provincial Grand Masters of Fife and Kinross, who joins us every week, uh, it's his birthday this evening, and there was a couple of others of our regulars had their birthdays this week, uh, Alistair Marshall and Charlie Stewart, so on behalf of everyone at the Lockdown Lecture Series, to those three, Brian, in particular, happy birthday, and particularly to you, uh, Ian, today celebrating it with Scotland uh, because seemingly this is a, the birthday of Scotland and the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Brian, I, as you will know, I, many of you will be aware of Brother Charles Winston of Lodge Montefiore. He has been very uh, involved in Zoom meetings over the last year, particularly around the Grand Lodge of Scotland History and Heritage uh, Group meetings. Uh, as many of you will be aware, he's the secretary of that group. And uh, along with the rest of the members, they've brought some very interesting uh, presentations to us in the digital world. Uh, he has used the excuse, however, uh, that he was too busy uh, and he'd been hiding from me knowing that I wanted him to come along and speak. Uh, but after a few months delay, Brian, I'm delighted to welcome Brother Charles Winston, past master of Lodge Montefiore, to the Lockdown Lecture Series. And Charles, the virtual floor is now yours, sir. Thank you very much, for Master, <clears throat> and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. You, you got me at long last. Brethren, uh, the events described in this paper take place in the early part of uh, Queen Victoria's reign um, and in an age when technology was in its infancy. The Victorians created and built so much that it's hard to appreciate the size and scale of what was actually achieved. Of course, Freemasons played their part. That's not to say that they did so because they were Freemasons but rather that their common belief in doing good, in building a better society and in helping others had always brought them together in a common cause. Freemasonry has been part of the fabric of society in Scotland for many centuries, and it's well established that its members worked for the common good and the Victorian era presented them with truly outstanding opportunities. The world's first industrial revolution had produced for the first time the large-scale manufacture of materials and made practical, previously impossible feats of engineering. Great undertakings brought together men of vision, and Glasgow was blessed with many such men. Throughout this period, it was common for events to be held on a grand scale. And Glasgow's International Exhibition in 1888 was just such an event. The exhibition was opened on the 8th of May that year by the Prince and Princess of Wales. By the time it closed its doors to the public, a million visitors had passed through the turnstiles every month. In every great undertaking, we expect to be able to identify disparate groups of men and to band them together by their various affiliations both religious and civil. What will be examined here is the role which Freemasons played in a great civic event and the common ground they shared. Large numbers of Freemasons were involved in the events in Glasgow in 1888. This paper can only attempt to investigate a limited number of the many connections and relationships that existed between them. It's extremely fortunate that an event of this kind was commemorated in such a unique manner because it provides a pivotal moment in time on which to begin. The painting in the title of this paper is the state visit of Her Majesty Queen Victoria 
to the Glasgow International Exhibition 1888. It's a remarkable painting because it not only enables the event itself to be depicted, but also the events which led up to it, the personalities involved and how they knew each other and why they came so effectively to work together. The painting, which measures approximately eight feet five inches by 13 feet four inches, hangs in Kelvin Grove Art Gallery at the top of the left main stairwell to the gallery. It commemorates the visit of Queen Victoria on the 22nd of August, 1888, and it was painted in truly remarkable detail. On that day, the artist, Sir John Lavery, was perched on a very small platform to the side of the dais. His view was restricted. He could only see through a small hole in a curtain that screened him off from the main platform. From his vantage point, the image which he saw must have seemed surreal. Gathered before him were the great and the good of Scottish society, standing in hushed silence. They awaited an audience with their queen and empress. As the audience began, Lavery began to sketch. Later that day, he wrote in his diary. I could only see the bath chair being wheeled in, the bowing courtiers and the privileged ones who surrounded the chair where sat the stout elderly lady wearing a widow's bonnet and looking rather severe. Everyone bowing to the ground was my first impression. A movement in the curtain caused her to look in my direction. It seemed to penetrate the dark material and expose me in my paint box. For a moment, disconcerted, my hand trembled, but I managed to jot down a few notes of value. The time was just coming up to half past five in the afternoon. John Lavery's words uniquely captured the essence of the moment. I managed to track down the actual sketch that Lavery made that day. You'll see that it lacks many of the details contained in the painting and none of the faces are recognizable. From the painting, you'll see the president of the exhibition Sir Archibald Campbell has stepped forward to deliver the loyal address. He ascended the first step of the dais, placing his left foot in front of him on the second step. He was well known to Her Majesty the Queen, having acted as her host at Blythswood House during her stay in Glasgow. Sir Archibald Campbell, Baronet, later Lord Blythswood, was the Grand Master Mason of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. He had been elected to that office three years earlier in 1885. Brother Sir Archibald Campbell was born in Florence in 1835, the eldest of nine children. He was 47 years old when he became Grand Master Mason. Educated privately for a career in the army, he joined the 79th Highlanders at the age of 16 before transferring to the Scots Guards. He fought and was badly injured in the Crimea retiring with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 1868 on the death of his father. A number of streets in Glasgow bear his name, including West Campbell Street and Blythwood Square. He entered Parliament for the constituency of Renfrewshire at a by-election in 1873, became a baronet in 1885, and was a member of the House of Commons until the defeat of the Conservative government in 1892 when he was elevated to the House of Lords in Salisbury's resignation honours list. In 1864, while still in the army, he married Augusta Clementina. She is the lady in black, just coming up to the center of your screen. She was the daughter of the wealthy liberal peer, Lord Carrington. This is Blythswood House, the family home, and it was here that Her Majesty Queen Victoria and her retinue stayed during her visit to Glasgow. The house was located in the Blythswood estate at Inchinnan. I think it's important that I should also briefly tell you something of Sir Archibald Campbell's other interests. Brother Sir Archibald Campbell was a gentleman physicist. In the days when members of the aristocracy could finance and follow their own scientific interests. Using his ample funds, 
He established a world-class laboratory at his home in Enshinan. It became known as the Blycewood Laboratory and was highly respected in scientific circles. I was unable to trace a photograph of the laboratory, but I did find a suitable watercolor. It was a substantial building in its own right. Here he carried out experiments on the frontiers of science, quite literally, particularly in the areas of cathode rays, spectroscopy, radioactivity, and aeronautical engineering. He was a close friend of Professor William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, who was a frequent visitor and supporter. Brother Campbell built all his own scientific equipment, and with one of his machines, he managed to obtain photographs of objects, and I quote, through entirely opaque substances. The claim was endorsed by Lord Kelvin, and incredible as it might sound, he would have been credited with the discovery of X-rays. But William Conrad Rontigan was the first to publish his experimental results, and it was he who was recognized for the discovery. Archibald Campbell was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1907, and some of his original equipment is now housed at the National Physics Laboratory. This is a somewhat ironic photograph, uh, brethren, of the Right Honourable Lord Blyswood as president of the Rontigan Society. And that was the name that was originally assigned to the society. It ultimately became the Royal Radiological Society. Somewhat ironic that he would be president of the Rontigan Society. One important and useful resource which I was able to use was a key to the painting. Made by Messrs Carter and Pratt, a firm of Glasgow lithographers and printers in Glasgow. In case you're not familiar with the name, Carter and Pratt were the company which was directly responsible for producing many of the world famous lithographic engravings, prints and designs of Charles Rennie Mackintosh and the Glasgow Boys. This is the engraving of the key to the painting that Carter and Pratt made. And it, come, it came accompanied by um, a list of 250 individuals who make up and compose the painting. In this extract from the key, we see Sir Archibald Campbell standing on his left, on the far side of the dais, in the uniform of the Royal Company of Archers, was the Right Honourable George Bailey Hamilton Arden, 11th Earl of Haddington. He was the deputy Grandmaster. He was elected as Grandmaster Mason when Sir Archibald Campbell retired in 1892. Standing beside the Earl of Haddington on his left was the Right Honourable James Ferguson, who was Provincial Grandmaster of Ayrshire. Behind Sir Archibald, on his right, was the Earl of Stair, a past acting Grand Master. And in the key, at number 111, standing in the second row, is Sir Michael Robert Shaw Stewart. He is wearing the bright red uniform of Lieutenant Cut, Lord Lieutenant of the County. Michael Sh Robert Shaw Stewart was the Provincial Grand Master of Renfrewshire West and a past Grand Master Mason of Scotland having been Grand Master Mason for 10 years, between 1873 and 1882. Standing to his right is his wife, Lady Octavia Shaw Stewart, and on his left was his daughter. This paper is not a treatise on John Lavery's artistic ability, nor does it attempt to criticize the artistic merit of the painting in any way. Such comments must be left to the talented art historians and many others who have chosen to comment on the painting over the years. However, the painting is itself an incredible piece of work, and it would not be possible to establish the particulars on which this paper depends without providing detailed background information as to how the painting was constructed. The scale of the problem facing John Lavery was daunting. Exactly how was he going to capture the scene before him? But capture it, he did. And in such incredible detail that every single individual in the painting 
can be clearly identified. Long after Lavery's death in 1941, art historians and critics argued about whether he made use of the camera as an aid to realism, but no photographic plates had ever been found. That situation changed in 2002 when new material was discovered. I'll now describe the circumstances as to how that came about. Hidden behind the curtain, next to the platform where Lavery was sketching, was James Craig Annan of T and R Annan and Sons, a firm of Glasgow photographers. Craig Annan was a world-class photographer. He joined his family business, T and R Annan and Sons of Glasgow, Hamilton and Edinburgh. And in 1883, he went to Vienna to learn the process of photogravure from the inventor, Carl Cleek. Craig Annan introduced photogravure processes into Britain and T and R Annan, having acquired the British patent, were to become the leading firm in Britain and the United States in gravure photographic printing. His photographs are not just well known, they are recognized worldwide. I'll give you four examples. He photographed Ber George Bernard Shaw, GK Chesterton, H.G. Wells. And of course, this worldwide well-known photograph of Charles Rennie Macintosh. His photography of the streets and buildings in Glasgow is highly regarded even today, and his presence at the exhibition was to prove crucial in the construction of Lavery's painting. In 2002 at the Glasgow Art Club, Brian McQuaid from the University of Glasgow's History of Art Department was carrying out some research in the cellar at 185 Bath Street when he came across a flood and fire damaged wooden box. Inside were 31 glass plate negatives. Nearly two years later, a further six glass negatives were discovered in a different part of the basement. And later, seven photographic prints came to light. Not only do they tell a fascinating story, they provide a sequence of images which are as astonishing as they are revealing. It's fair to say they are a goldmine of information. I begin with plate one. Before I describe the contents of this plate, I'd like to point out that there is a clock on the wall beside the sign. In the painting itself, Lavery did not include the clock. So plate one, this plate, which has a piece missing from the top right hand corner, is the first in a series of nine surviving negatives that Annan took on the first day of Victoria's visit to the Great Hall at the Exhibition Centre. Here we see that the Queen and her entourage have not yet arrived. Victoria's dais is unoccupied. The file of soldiers standing on the far side of the hall is a mixture of the Queen's archers and the Queen's own Royal Glasgow Yeomanry who served as her guard of honour during the visit. They're lined up in front of the entranceway to the fine arts section, whose sign can be seen just below a balcony, which is crowded by members of the press. The solitary figure pacing the floor is the sixth Duke of Buccleuch, captain of the Royal Company of Archers. It is he who performed the presentation of arrows when the Queen arrived. He also presided over the Queen's visit to the Great Exhibition and he's number 49 in the key. The time on the clock is 4.54 p.m. Plate two. This shows us more or less the same view as the previous plate, except that we see less of the right-hand side and more of the left. The Duke has moved across the hall to the foreground on our left and is now speaking to some guests who have just come into view of the camera. In the mid left in the background, there's a large number of paintings on exhibition in the arts section. Both the first and second plates have been taken from the women's industry section, which is in the northern and eastern corner of the Great Hall. The time on the clock is 4.55. Plate three. 
plate three. 35 minutes have now elapsed since the previous photograph has been taken. This is the moment of Queen Victoria's arrival. The crowd is standing to attention. The gentlemen guests have removed their hats and the soldiers are saluting to the strains of God save the Queen. Queen Victoria can be seen between the pillars of her dais, just in front of her three attendants, who are Her Royal Highness Princess Henry of Battenberg and Her Royal Highness Princess Alice of Hesse. The Queen and her two attendants are numbers one, two and three in the key, respectively. To the right-hand side of the plate, in descending order, is His Royal Highness the Grand Duke of Hesse, His Royal Highness the Hereditary Grand Duke of Hesse, and His Royal Highness Prince Henry of Battenberg. Made way along the first file of people facing the Queen on the left is the Duchess of Montrose, who stands out from the others because of her brightly striped dress, which was yellow and black, and her highly piled hairdo, which was fixed with a glittering tiara. The figure in the centre of the plate, walking towards the foot of the dais, is of course Brother Sir Archibald Campbell, number 51 in the key. He will shortly read the loyal address to the Queen. The time on the clock is 5.30 p.m. Plate four. This shows the presentation of the arrows a ceremony which dates back to the very early years of the 18th century, when the Royal Company of Archers was incorporated and in return for certain grazing rights, the company was required to present to the sovereign three barbed gold arrows whenever the sovereign visited Scotland. The presentation of the arrows immediately followed the playing of the national anthem. The time tells us but it was only a minute or two has passed since the Queen has made her entrance. The time on the clock is 5.32. Plate five. Sir Archibald Campbell has just moved onto the bottom step of the dais and stands reading the loyal address to the Queen. This is almost identical to the scene that Lavery has taken and transposed into the centerpiece of his large oil of Victoria. Sir Archibald is three or four minutes into his speech. The clock on the wall now reads 5.34 p.m. Plate six. Sir Archibald has stepped down from the dais after his presentation and is looking over his shoulder into the crowd while Her Majesty gives a short speech. The time on the clock is 5.36 p.m. Before I come to plate seven, I'd like to show you this extract from the key to the painting, because this, the next uh, photograph relates to the right-hand side of the dais and features the gentleman, the gent numbers four to 19 in the key. We can see here, the individual gentleman standing from the detail in the painting. Plate seven. The Queen and her suite have now sat down at the close of Sir Archibald's address. The three uniformed men in the foreground on the right are the same trio of royals I mentioned earlier, while the left of the plate shows uniformed men and a glimpse into the interior of the main hall. The top left corner and a piece from the side are missing from this negative. Plate eight. This view of the interior comes from the opposite side of the fine arts side of the Great Hall in the south and eastern corner of the building. Victoria's throne now appears on the left while the dignitaries facing her dais appear on the right. Above the curtain doorway on the far side of the hall, we see the sign for the women's industry section, which was beneath another balcony of guests. This tells us that more than one photographer was present. High up in the right-hand corner is the Glasgow coat of arms, which is held in place by four diagonal spars. The bottom left spar runs down to a tall and narrow curtained off alcove. And I would say that this is the place from which Lavery painted his sketch 
of the scene in the hall. Furthermore, if you continue down the line, I'm told by various experts that you can see what looks like the photographer James Craig Annan beside his camera equipment. I'm not convinced that actually they're there, but I'm told they are there. Annan's view from this standpoint and Labrys from above both fit in with the scenes in plates one to seven. And Lavery's small oil sketch of the hall, which I showed you earlier. The time on the clock is 5.40 p.m. Plate nine. This is view from the hall has been taken just after Queen Victoria has left. <clears throat> There's no longer any ordered crowd formality and lots of people are milling around. Apart from a line of guards on the right hand side of the plate, some of the crowd are filing into the fine arts section, presumably following the Queen and her retinue as they tour the exhibits. The time on the clock is 5.57 p.m. The audience has come to an end. Whilst the sequence of time lapse images would prove to be invaluable to Lavery for the general layout of the painting, it did not provide him with sufficient facial details, nor did it provide enough information on what each individual was wearing. Lavery invited many of the principal guests in the painting to come to his studio over a period of many months. There, he individually prepared sketches of them in watercolour and oil. In this next sequence of slides, I'll provide just three of the many sketches that he made. Bailey Thomas Watson, number 66 in the key to the painting, a member of Lodge Sinclair, number 362. Here he is. Um, actually from the painting, and this is the sketch that Lavery made in his studio. As I mentioned, um, Bailey Watson was a member of Lodge St. Clair. Secondly, number 69 in the key, Robert uh, M. Mitchell. Bailey Mitchell was a member of Lodge the Princess. As I mentioned, number 69 in the key, and this is the sketch that Lavery made in his studio. And finally, we come to um, ex Bailey councillor William Pettigrew, who was number 162 in the key, and Miller Pettigrew was a member of Lodge Pollock, number 772. Brethren from the highest ranks to the ordinary members were here in number. Amongst them were not only the Grand Master, there was past Grand Master, Grand Office Bearers, Provincial Grand Masters former, present and future being present. There were reigning masters, past masters and others. Before I move on, I'll mention just some of the principal Freemasons who were present and I'll place them on the key. I'll begin with number 56 on the key, brother James Sellers, the exhibition architect, who was a member of the Lodge of Glasgow number three bis. Brother Sellers was chairman of the Master Masons Association in Glasgow and was the exhibition architect. His death was unfortunately a direct consequence of the Glasgow International Exhibition because he died from septicemia as a result of standing on a rusty nail during a visit to the exhibition. Next, number 65 on the key, a very young William Burrell, a member of Lodge of the Princes, number 607. Number 151 in the key, Sir John Ewer Primrose, a member of Lodge Plantation. Number 169, the Right Honourable Charles Cochran Bailey, the Grand Master Mason of Freemason, Scottish Freemasonry in India. Number 189, Dr. James Simpson Cunningham, a member of Lodge the Princess. Number 211, the Reverend George Stuart Burns, Grand Chaplain. Number 224, Sir James Bell, patron of the Masonic Bazaar and a member of Lodge the Princes. Number 216, Brother James Caldwell, MP, Substitute Provincial Grand Master of Renfrewshire. Number 201, Sir James Bain, past Lord Provost of Glasgow 
past provincial Grand Master of Glasgow, a member of Lodge the Princes number 607. Number 109, Brother Peter Denny, member of Dumbarton Kill winning number 18, substitute provincial Grand Master of Dumbartonshire. Number 87, Sir John Muir, Lord Provost of Glasgow, and a member of Lodge the Princes. And finally, in this group, Colonel William Clark, the Exhibition Marshal, a member of Lodge the Princes, number 607. In every tier of Scottish Freemasonry, they were all represented here. It's certainly reasonable to deduce that Freemasons were working at the heart of society. They were part of it, not separated or isolated, but integral. Whilst Freemasonry was and is essentially a private application, it's clear that its members were not merely content to practice their convictions in the confines of their many lodges, but were drawn to manifest their teachings for the benefit of others in society at large. In addition to the many sketches that Lavery painted of individuals in his studio, he also undertook his own photography. I've made a small selection of these images, and I'll begin with Lady Campbell. Sir Archibald and Lady Campbell were both heavily involved in organizing the exhibition. He was elected as president of the International Exhibition in 1886, whilst Lady Augusta Campbell was president of the women's section, which ranked as one of the largest and most comprehensive divisions in the exhibition. Queen Victoria paid a personal visit to inspect, to inspect the exhibits in this section and requested a number of samples of the work exhibited to be delivered to her. I'd also like to show you a small representative sample from the many photographs that Lavery took in his studio. These images represent a broad spectrum of the guests that were present today, some of whom were Freemasons and some of whom were not. I'll begin with uh, image number nine. Um, this is Alexander Stephen of Alexander Stevens and Sons, Glasgow Shipbuilders. Both he and the brother Sir Archibald Campbell were honorary members of the Institute of Engineers and Shipbuilders and had a very close association. Alexander Stevens is number 209 in the key. And from the photograph, you can see some of the many individual portraits that Lavery painted in his studio. And plate 16 in this series shows William Mackenzie, who was the um, Dean of Guild at the time, and some 20 all sketches, which are propped up against the floor, some framed. Mackenzie was number 93 in the key. Uh, this is William Walls, the exhibition's honorary treasurer, number 94 in the key. In fact, just going back to that, you can see many of these um, images were taken on the same day because Lavery moved the paintings on the wall around quite a bit. And these, this image was taken at the same time as the previous image, or at least on the same day. And the last group of images, firstly, Lord Hamilton of the L an honorary member of the Exhibition Association and host to the Prince and Princess of Wales when the exhibition was opened. And on the right is his son, Gavin Hamilton of DL. You can actually see, uh, my apologies, you can actually see Lavery's tennis rackets hanging on the wall in his studio. And finally, a group of three from the Royal Company, Archers. Um, beginning first with Bernard B. McGeorge on the left, in the centre, um, George Miller Cunningham, and finally, uh, the mustachioed William Benjamin Paul Blythe. Brethren, there is an enormous amount of material, and I can only show you a very small amount of it. In attempting to explain how the amazing detail in Lavery's Victoria came about, I used the key by Messrs Carter and Pratt, the firm of Glasgow engravers. I used the remarkable sequence of time-lapsed images taken by James Craig Annan, which ultimately proved so valuable to Lavery in the construction of the painting. I presented some examples of the many individual portraits painted by James Lavery, this one of the deputy Grand Master, the 11th Earl of Haddington. 
I've shown how Lavery made use of photography in his own studio and elsewhere. And of course, I've made ample use of Lavery's painting itself and established just some of the principal Freemasons who were present. Now, due to time restrictions, I intend to stop at this point. But before I do so, I'd like to provide a brief glimpse of the Bailey that is the subject of the second of this three-part paper. Standing directly in the row behind Lady Campbell is indeed the Bailey, who is the focus of the second part of this paper. His image was instantly recognisable to me over 60 years ago because I actually knew who he was. For those of you who are not familiar with him, his name is Michael Simons, and he was the founding master of my mother lodge, Montefiore, number 753. Michael Simons is 107 in the key. And just to show you how accurate Lavery's painting is, I obtained an official photograph from the Glasgow Corporation archives and I've superimposed it here. And it's astonishing that how much the likeness is so close to the photograph. Michael Simons is in fact one of three members of Lodge Montefiore 753 who appear in Lavery's Victoria. His position in the painting is no accident and his role in the exhibition will I hope become clear um, at an opportunity in the future if were I to present the second part of this paper. Right, worshipful master and brethren, on the afternoon of the 22nd of August, 1888, at 5.29 p.m., Her Majesty Queen Victoria and her retinue entered the Great Hall of Glasgow's International Exhibition at Kelvin Grove. It was a truly remarkable moment for all of those who were present that afternoon. When the exhibition closed in November that year, it had been an outstanding success. The exhibition had made a large profit. £12,000 was allocated to a competition for the design of the Glasgow School of Art. The balance of the money was used directly to build Kelvin Grove art galleries. That is the measure of what was achieved, and it left a legacy in the city of Glasgow which would be difficult, if not impossible, to surpass. This is the actual building that they built from the profits of the exhibition. Right, Worshipful Master, that now concludes my presentation of the paper thus far this evening. Thank you for your kind attention. Brother Charles Winston, uh, on behalf of everyone here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi, can I thank you so much for giving us that insight into civic society, Freemasonry in Glasgow and Scotland over 130 years ago. I'm just glad that I was persistent in my endeavours to track you down and persuade you to come along and speak to us this evening, Charles. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure that there will be some questions in the chat, uh, but I do have one. Uh, to start with, the Prince's Lodge seems to be quite recurrent in your presentation. Was that the, the go-to lodge for the good and the great of Glasgow back in the day? And if so, uh, is it still the same? Albeit we may possibly not have as many of the good and the great joining Freemasonry in the 21st century. It's certainly true, and there'll be others here today um, who probably know more about the Prince's Lodge than I do, but it, it was certainly true that the Prince's Lodge was um, considered um, it, with a very high quality of lodge, and certainly they did attract a lot of people, as can be shown by the numbers who appear in the painting. As generally, if you pick them from civic society, in that image, there are 250 named individuals, about half of them are women, at least about 125 men. Um, there's at least 40 to 45 that I can identify. That's a very high proportion of, of men who were Freemasons in a group of 120 men. So it says a lot about Freemasonry. Um, they were certainly the most represented lodge that was there. Um, other lodges were represented, and some of them quite well represented, but not as well as 607. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, we've got a couple of comments. Uh, congratulations, Brother Winston, on a very interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to parts two and three and four and five. We will get you back at some point, Charles. Uh, truly outstanding, Charles. Uh, what a superb piece of research and excellent graphics. Great story and superb graphics. Uh, Ken Wallace, I noticed in one of the slides, uniformed officers on the dais were wearing dark armbands. Do you know why? Um, well, in actual fact, um, everybody in the presence of Queen Victoria was obliged to wear dark clothing. And um, because of the death of Prince Albert, now it didn't matter how many years had passed, she, she spent the remainder of her life in mourning and everybody in her company and surrounding her um, had to be in mourning dress. There was one exception there that I mentioned, and that was the Duchess of Montrose, a lady who appeared in a bright yellow and black dress, a highly piled hairdo. And the Duchess of Montrose, um, I've, you know, I think she's probably well known. She was quite a girl. Um, there's a pub named after her in Sackey Hall Street. It's still there today. So she had a bit of a, um, she, had a she was well known uh, you know, as a member of high society in Scotland. And I think she was very determined. I mean, you could see um, Lady Campbell dressed fully in black. Obviously, the Queen was staying with her, but everybody else was in dark clothing, men, gentlemen wearing armbands, and there's the Duchess of Montrose in a brightly coloured dress, standing directly in the front of her. So that's the explanation for the armbands. Okay, thank you. One of your own past masters, Brother Ori Lovett, one of our previous speakers, is asking, when are we hearing the next two lectures then, Charles? Uh, I'll let you reply to him offline for that one as well, but I will follow that up with you as well. Dick and Sandback comments, the, the painting is extraordinary, but I was also very taken with the photographs. Do we know how long the exposures would B, there were some blurred individuals. Also, how long did they need between photographs? Well, I suppose it's a reasonable question. You can see from the movement of people just standing swaying, I suppose, that the exposure was probably a second or so, or perhaps longer. Very difficult to be, to be sure. You could, you could perhaps ask an expert photographer. These were old glass plate um, bellows cameras mounted on a tripod and uh, you took the front cap off to expose and put the cut back on and then you had to change the slides over, put in the black darkening plates, take the slide out, put another slide in and remove them. Um, some of the, the images were one or two minutes apart. So I don't think it was too difficult in those days to do it. Okay, I think there's a, there's a follow-up question. Would it not be used flash as they took the pictures? But I think you, you would refer back to needing an expert I, historian on photography to do that, to answer that. There's no indication of any bright reflections. There's quite a lot of glass there. I think you would see the reflections in the, the paintings on the walls and so on. So I don't know if, if, if flash was used. Yeah, we've, we've got a, a comment uh, from Alan Keegan, and I'll, I'll try and get the, the pronunciation right so uh, it comes across. Terrific insight, Charles. Thank you very much. Can I ask if Queen Victoria's gift was made by the We Are a People of Glasgow? So some of you will understand that, Brian. For some of our Brian from overseas, uh, that joke may have been lost on you, uh, but I think there is some significance to the one of the football teams in Glasgow there. Uh, Can I uh, say something? Uh, Gordon? Yes, Alistair. Que Queen Victoria had, I think on the same day, if I'm correct, officially opened the, the city chambers in Glasgow and she had been driven into uh, the quadrangle at the city chambers. I think a train had come in at St. Enoch Station and she was not there for very long. She was presented with a, a gold key and then she was driven off to, to Kelvin Grove. I think that's what happened. In actual fact, she didn't even get out of the coach. No. Um, she was driven there. She declared it open and they, they drove off. Yeah. I, think, I believe it was only her second visit to Glasgow. In fact, I think she only came back to Glasgow twice uh, in, in her entire reign. She visited Glasgow early in her reign. I yes. believe the... The drainage was not to her liking, and she swore she would never return. 
She did, in fact, return in 1888. Yeah. On the second city of the empire. Uh, so what a wonderful talk, Charles. Looking forward for the rest of the talks. Thank you. Thanks, Brother Charles. I, from Martin Gunn, Charles, do you know how many got their portrait painted? Well, Glasgow District Council, um, although it was originally um, Glasgow Corporation, um, when they were offered all the individual portraits that Lavery made and they didn't want them. Um, they ultimately saw the error of their ways and decided to accept them. There are something like 60 to 70 in the city archives at the moment. I I've seen all of them. Uh, I've only photographed a number of them that are of interest to me. Um, but yes, there, there aren't, there, there isn't over 200, for example. Some of, the, some of Lavery's work was done by photography, some was done by painting, and the rest, one would assume, has just disappeared. Okay, thank you, Charles. That was very enlightening. As you and I have discussed civic society and Freemasonry and the differences over the last 100 years on a few occasions, and things like this just really bring it to life for me, and I trust that it's brought it to life to all the brand here this evening. So. Thank you very much. Uh, the final comment to Stevie Chalmers uh, is a, a wee reference to those two football teams in Glasgow and Robert Burns's mark. And uh, I'll just leave that one in the chat for you to uh, to read, Bern. Uh, so, Brother Charles Winston, thank you so much, sir, for uh, a very enjoyable uh, sojourn back 130 odd years to uh, Victorian era Glasgow. Uh, I'm sure that has really inspired many of them to, to maybe research some of the names that you mentioned. Uh, and I will certainly put up some information on them later on this evening. Brian, before I unmute and allow you to I uh, say your thank yous and good evenings to Charles. Uh, there's a couple of requests up on our Facebook page this afternoon from Brother Mike Neville, uh, looking into some information on uh, men of medicine uh, who potentially were Freemasons in a Scottish lodge. Uh, I've not been able to find anything for them uh, in the various books that I, you can see behind me, Brian, uh, but maybe some of you out there may know some more. And if you could have a look at that, uh, the one that he's looking for is Charles Lister of uh, Listerine fame, Brian, the, the, the mouthwash and all those other medical advancements that he made. And there's a variety of other medical men that he's researching for uh, one of his books. So if there's any help that uh, the hive mind out there of uh, our lockdown lecture series can help them with, I'd be very much appreciative. Thank you, Brian. Next week, Brian, we have a, a, an American brother, or should I say a Texican brother, a brother Robert Marshall, who's coming to talk to us about the history of uh, Freemasonry and its connection with the Alamo. Uh, this was a, a subject that was requested uh, a few months ago, Brian. So very much looking forward to Brother Robert Marshall coming over and speaking to us uh, next Tuesday evening. Uh, with that, Brian, Charles, once again, thank you so much on behalf of everyone here at the Lodge Hope of Cratchy Lockdown Lecture Series. Brian, please unmute yourself and say your personal thank yous to Brother Charles Winston. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Charles, well done. Absolute pleasure to Thank listen you, Charles. to you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. Number two. Excellent. Well done, really Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Super. Very well done. Well done. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. Very interesting. Thank you. Very enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you, much, Charles. Charles. Absolutely Thank riveting you. presentation, especially on the photographic detail. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you very much. Look forward to the lectures two and three. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, Thank you Charles. Rendition. Most interesting and well researched. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> That's the only way to describe it. Well done. Mm.
Thank you very much, Charles. From 754 to 753, I hope to see you soon. We'll be there. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. That was very, very interesting. And like uh, all the rest, I'm sure I look forward immensely to the, the next two or maybe three or four lectures. Thank you. Thanks. Brother Thanks. Charles, a superb piece of research and the way you put the presentation together, uh, I take my cap off to you, sir. It was wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Brian, I'm going to give you five. Well done, Charles. Well done. Yeah. Thank you very well, much indeed. Very well done. Yeah. Excellent presentation, Charles. Enjoyed it. Was well, excellent, Charles. Thank you very much. And for Brian. Thanks again, Gordon. Good night, all. Stay safe. Good night, brother. Good night, Good night, Good night all. Stay safe. All. All right, brother. And three. Thanks yeah. very much again, Gordon. Thank you. Gordon, I've come across something uh, from Robert Burns. Uh, maybe I, I send you a message. We going? Please do, you. And two. Good night, Take care, everyone. And one. And Brother Charles Winston, finally, <laughs> once again, on behalf of the Lodge Hope Karachi, thank you so much, sir. Good evening.